concept. It's defined by an equation of just two terms, z squared plus c. That's all there is to it. Yeah, that simple equation, z squared or z squared plus c, continue, you feed a number into it, then carry on over and over again, sort of cranking the number back round and round, and then plot the result on the screen. So I won't go into details, but this is the first appearance of this set. And what it does, it divides all possible numbers into two categories. It's really a map or a boundary or a, a fence, if you like, dividing one class of numbers from another. And you can tell your computer to go into any spot here and say, recompute that area to a higher degree of precision and then blow it up on the screen. So you can use the computer as a microscope and you can continue that process forever. Some of the images are incredibly beautiful and are going to have a great impact on artistic design in the next decade or so. Um, I found what looked like black holes and I'd like to show them to you. So what I'm going to do now essentially is to zoom into it, increasing the magnification uh, many fold and if I press the right button it should happen now. The computer will now give you this image and I think you'll agree when it comes up it's a very impressive black hole and it'll be even more so when I start it into action. Oh yes, it is magnificent, isn't it? Ah, you ain't seen nothing yet. I should explain that this magnification, you remember the original picture which it took about the same area, this time I've magnified it about a thousand times, so the picture you saw first is now 500 feet across. Now let's see if this works. Now isn't that lovely? So there is matter streaming into this black hole. Well, now, when I found this black hole, I started exploring the neighborhood, and I, I very quickly found another. Indeed. Now this... That's lovely. Now this is the second black hole. Now it looks just like the earlier one, but this is on a far greater magnification. The original Mandelbrot set now is I think about 10 million miles wide. This is enormously bigger than the first one you saw, yet essentially it's the same kind of pattern. This is black hole number three, and this one took me 22 hours of computing the day before I left Sri Lanka. It, I had the computer running all night, and I'm rather proud of this one because on this scale, that original little picture you saw is the width of the orbit of Mars. So you, you understand that no human being has ever seen that picture pattern before, simply because of probabilities. And you can explore the Mandelbrot set by blowing up bits and pieces of it, and you're pretty sure that you, no one's ever seen that. You're the first person to see it. And each time you're being drawn towards... You're being sucked into it. Mathematical into infinity. S into smaller... And s yes. This is real mathematical infinity. This goes on forever and ever. It's limited only by the capacity of your machine and the speed with which it can do its calculations. I am doing calculations here. You may not be able to see that enormously long number, the 20-digit numbers or so, and the machine is multiplying those together hundreds of times a second. Now. The thing that fascinates me about this is that it is infinite in detail. You can go on forever and ever. Now, I would like to ask Stephen this question. Is the real universe also infinite in detail? I mean, we know we have molecules, atoms, electrons, protons, subatomic, right down to the quarks so far. But does it continue forever and ever? Or is there a limit? Is there a basement to the real universe? Professor Hawking. We will discover new structures when look at the universe on smaller and smaller scales. But in the case of the universe, there seems to be a limiting scale. It is called the Planck length, and it's about a million billion billion times smaller than an inch. This means that there is a limit to how complex the universe can be. It also means that the universe could be described by a theory that is fairly simple, at least on scales of the Planck length. I just hope that we are smart enough to find it. Are we smart enough to find it, Arthur? Well, I wonder, because after all, we're still pretty primitive organisms, and the universe is very old, 
And uh, I just don't know. I would like to think so, but then there's a feeling, when we found it, then what? Where do we go from here? I'd like to turn our attention back now to Professor Stephen Hawking. Do you think that we could ever hope to use the old science fiction trick of diving into a black hole and then traveling to another part of the cosmos? Some recent work indicates that particles that fall into a black hole can come out again from another black hole somewhere else in the universe. At first sight, this seems the ideal method of space travel. Just find a black hole and jump in it. But there are snags. First, there doesn't seem to be any way to choose where you come out. Worse than that, your history in real time would come to a sticky end as you were torn apart by the gravitational fields inside a black hole. Your history in imaginary time would continue out of the other black hole. But that might not be much consolation to someone being made into spaghetti. It would be like traveling on some airlines I could name. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you see the, the actual role of science fiction? Is it purely escapism or do you see it as having a, a, a very real purpose in broadening our, our patterns of thinking, opening our minds to the kind of, of vast concepts which we're discussing today? Well, first of all, there's no re objection to escapism in the right places. In fact, C.S. Lewis once remarked to me, the only people who don't like, who object to escapism are, are jailers. And uh, <laughs> we all want to escape occasionally, but science fiction is often very far from escapism. In fact, you might say that science fiction is escape, is escape into reality. It's a fiction which does concern itself with m real issues, the, the origin of man, our future. In fact, I don't think I cannot think of any form of literature which is more concerned with real issues, reality. Well, what do you have to say to that, Professor Hawking? I don't believe in stories of flying saucers and other unidentified flying objects. If time travel were possible, we should have already been visited by people from the future. I think if we were being visited by people from another time or another planet, it would be much more obvious and probably very unpleasant. I don't want to make contact with another civilization except at a safe distance. It might be like the North American Indians making contact with the white men. I bet they wish they had never sold Manhattan. I'll bet they did now. Carl, you are the world's leading expert in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, Professor Hawking doesn't want to make contact with them. Why do you want to make contact with them? Well, uh, first off, I would say we have little choice in the matter. Um, that is, uh, we uh, have already announced, or rather I should say, Magnus, uh, you fellows have already announced uh, the fact that there is a low-level technical civilization in this part of the galaxy because television programs uh, get out at the speed of light. Uh, and uh, since any uh, other civilization who detects those signals is unlikely to be uh, at or before our state of technological advance, since we've just invented radio technology, so to say, they are much more likely to be in our technological future. And uh, the question as to whether their intentions are uh, benign or otherwise is, of course, of interest, but we have uh, nothing to say about, uh, about the matter. So, uh, therefore, I think uh, we might as well hope that it's benign if they're, if they're out there. From my point of view, the search for extraterrestrial life, and especially the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is one of the key philosophical, scientific, and human...